So the title of this is, How Much of Judas is in You? Oh, I was thinking I'm from South Carolina. My South Carolina title would be, You Better Watch Yourself, You Rascals. So maybe the first one's better, I don't know. So, uh, you know, so since Easter is a few weeks to get away, I, I thought we'd look a few minutes at Judas' betrayal and uh, look at it from the book of Matthew, the book of John. We'll start with the book of Ru- Ru- um, Luke with just a little caveat there. Um, you know, Judas had been Jesus' disciples for, for over three years. And, you know, you just have all kinds of questions about Judas. You know, he's seen miracles. He watched deaf ears pop open, eyes receive sight, lame people walk, lepers healed, the dead raised, demons cast. I mean, you're right there. You're one of the inner circle. I mean, you're listening and you hear behind the scenes, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, 7. I mean, the people that that was taught to were the disciples. Judas was there. He heard some of the best teaching that humanity can receive from the Son of God. Think about it. Been with Jesus over three years, had, had, had been influenced so deeply by Jesus, but he went astray. So I just have questions. I mean, number one, why would Jesus even choose somebody like him? John 6, Jesus said he knew who would betray him ahead of time because he knew what was in man. To wait a minute. He chose Judas knowing what was in his character and he chose him anyway? Why would he, why would he put somebody in his inner circle like that? I mean, you know, we go to these, these uh, leadership conferences and all. They tell you what kind of character. You got to do background checks. Got to figure the person out. Do the personality type. Uh, Judas was just all wrong. And Jesus woke up after... Well, he came up after a night of prayer and said, you're one of my 12, come on. He knew ahead. And, and then, uh, you know, why? 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 Why, would, why would Jesus do that? And so, um, just questions. How could this happen? It's an amazing phenomenon. And I've seen it all my life. I've been walking with Jesus over 42 years now. I've had people that were in Bible school with me. I've been to three. I've had people in church life with me. Uh, very over the years of time in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, here in the 21st century. And and, uh, people who love God, who were exposed literally to the power of Jesus manifesting in the service and the power of the Word of God, just walk away as though it meant nothing. And that's what happened to Judas. And that's an amazing thing. It reminds me of... um, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, this is message paraphrase. Listen to this. Test yourselves to make sure you are solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourselves regular checkups. You need firsthand evidence, not mere hearsay, that Jesus Christ is in you. Test it out. If you fail the test, do something about it. That's positive, right? Yeah, so, uh, you know... As we look at Judas, and I'll make some comments about that, this would be a good time, you know, just to check up on your own life. How many know we're all in the process of change? And this is a verse uh, from Philippians 2, the Apostle Paul. uh, God's Word is literally God's Word translation. That's the translation says this, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. My dear friends, you've always obeyed not only when I'm with you, but even now more now that I'm absent in the same way, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's God who produces in you the desires and actions that please him. So how many know we're all in process? God doesn't call us nor even use us because we're perfect. He calls us because it's his will, his plan, his purpose. And God calls us uh, to walk with him. And then God places in every human being a desire to do something. An ability to do something, a skill set, we call it today, right? So, so his desire is that we don't use our skill set only on ourselves or only to better our business, but we should use our skill set for the glory of God. Yes or no? Yes. So perhaps that's the reason that he uh, chose uh, Judas. Judas obviously had a skill set with finances. He, he was the purse man. He kept the finances for Jesus' ministry. So it's kind of interesting. So let's, let's examine this a little bit. Go with me to the book of Luke, chapter 22. 
And uh, there's just an unusual caveat when, when, uh, when the Scriptures begin talking about the story of Judas and Jesus' betrayal. And the caveat is the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. So it says, so let's just read and I'll make some comment. Uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, verse 1, which is also called Passover, was approaching. Um, the leading priests and teachers of religious law were plotting how to kill Jesus, but they were afraid of the people's reaction. Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12 disciples. Now, that doesn't mean he became demon-possessed. What that verse is referencing is, is this. Um, the, the avenue that Satan has into every life is thoughts. How many hear what I'm saying? We're, we got to be careful of the King James Version of Ephesians 6, 11, the wilds. The strategies of the devil, the Greek word there really means with the road. Satan comes with the, on a road into every human life, and that road is thoughts. So see, you have to ask yourself, what kind of thoughts have I been allowing myself to ponder? Judas obviously had some thoughts. He was carrying the money bag. We'll find later he was a thief. He loved money. Greed was at the root of his personality. It's a problem. Jesus knew he had a problem with Judas and let it happen. That's the key. Whew. Man, that just makes me think so much, you know. But Satan entered Judas Iscariot. So when Satan entered, that means that, means that he gave in to a thought that he kept having over and over repetitiously. So see, ask yourself, what kind of thoughts are coming to me repetitiously over and over? You can't keep thoughts from coming through your mind. But like Kenneth Hagin used to tell us at Rhema, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head but you can keep him from building a nest in your hair or on your bald head. Right. So you can't keep thoughts from coming, but you don't have to keep dwelling on them. And obviously he dwelt on the thought and Satan said, I got you now, boy. And he went to the leading priests, captains of the temple guard to discuss the best way to portray Jesus to them. They were delighted and they promised to give him money. So he agreed and began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus so they could arrest him when the crowds weren't around. So, so let's talk about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I think this is really a, a cool little caveat to start this story. Feast of Unleavened Bread really was an eight-day feast which included Passover. And all this originated, you remember, the Israelites were in, uh, were in Egyptian captivity for 400 years. And uh, they became slaves after a period of time. Joseph took them to Egypt and they became slaves. And they began to cry out uh, during Moses' time, uh, you know, we want to be free, God. We want to be free. This is terrible, terrible bondage. So they came out and uh, the uh, ten plagues against the gods of the Egyptians in the book of Exodus. You probably read about that. The last one was the death of the firstborn. And God said to the Israelites, put some... Uh, blood of a sacrificial animal on the doorpost of your house. And when the death angels come to slay the firstborn, when they see the blood, they'll pass over. So we get the feast of Passover from that oldest feast in the world. We may talk about it some next week. And then after that, um, uh, they were to go and they were to cook unleavened bread before they went um, because they had to be really fast. And so the Feast of Unleavened Bread, after the day of Passover, that Passover feast, it was seven more days. And, and all through the, the millennia of time, now over 3,000 years, the Israelites have observed Passover and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which starts with Passover feast, next seven days. And here's what they do. They make sure there's no leaven in their home. So, uh, so even today, uh, Hasidic Jews will do this, those that practice Judaism, they'll, they'll get some leaven and just drop it around the house, put it on the window seals, and then they'll have their children go and find it, and they'll get a broom, and they'll get a dustpan, and they'll sweep up all the leaven, and, and the seven days are for purification. The seven days are to remind them that they went in haste out of the land of Egypt, and they had to, they had to cook bread that was unleavened. And the leaven is an interesting thing. Jewish rabbis, ancient Jewish rabbis, believe that leaven represented the evil impulses of the heart. Interesting. Leaven, as you know, is yeast. And what does yeast do? Those that love to cook, it permeates dough and it sours and ferments and causes the dough to become much larger than normal, right? So, so the effects of yeast, it changes the dough. It contaminates the dough, 
and infects the dough with fermenting properties. Now, now over in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul took this and, and he said leaven is a type of sin. So 1 Corinthians 5, here's a man who was sleeping with his stepmother, which is ridiculous at best. It's just ridiculous. And he was in the church and he was boasting about him sleeping with my stepmother. Wow. Your boasting about this is terrible, he says. Don't you realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast by removing the wicked person from among you. Then you'll be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So let us sacrifice. Uh, celebrate the festival not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. So, so the scripture starts talking about Judas by mentioning the feast of unleavened bread, and this was a feast just before Jesus, you know, went to the cross and included the Passover. And so, uh, really, really interesting here. So, here's the story of Judas betraying Jesus. Let's talk about it. A little bit as I go through this, you may want to ask yourself the question, how much of Judas do I have in me? Sobering. It gets quiet when you talk like this. Here we are, turn to the book of Matthew 26. Here we are. Here's the plot to kill Jesus. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, Passover begins in two days. So this is probably Tuesday of the week of his passion. Uh, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. At the same time, the leading priests and elders were meeting at the residence of Caiaphas, the high priest, plotting how to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. And we'll read later that Judas is right there plotting with them. But not during Passover celebration, they agreed, or the people may uh, riot. And um, Josephus, who... Uh, wrote a history of the Jewish race, uh, records riots during this, during this feast because there were just thousands and thousands of people in Jerusalem. They didn't want to riot, so they had to be kind of cautious. So he goes on, meanwhile, verse 6, Jesus was in Bethany. Bethany is a little village right near the Mount of Olives. I've been to Israel. I've seen where the village Bethany is. Really close there. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. So lepers can never uh, be around other people. They have to be confined to private quarters. But this leper was healed. He's excited. Jesus is eating in his house. Isn't that cool? While he was eating, a woman came in. We'll find out later. This is Mary who had demon spirits cast out of her. She was a prostitute. She was excited that Jesus was there in the house and she was there with him. So it says... uh, A woman came with with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. We'll find out later that this was nard from India. It was very expensive. It literally cost one year's salary. And so usually people, it was sometimes given as a gift to a family or a family would save over a period of many, many, many years. And they would use this nard as as one of the ointments that they poured on the on the human body, uh, at, right after someone died, they didn't have embalming and all that, and they did not, uh, they didn't, uh, you know, cremate and all that because they respected the rights of the, the the bodies of the deceased. So they poured ointment all over. So anyway, she had this, and and uh, she poured it over his head. If you look in the Old Testament, I found two places where the king was anointed with oil. She was literally anointing Jesus for his kingship. Secondly, Jesus knew he was going to die, and he makes reference here in a minute. She's anointing me from a burial. Wow. So the disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste, they said. We'll find out later. This is Judas said that, and he talked to the other disciples about it. How many know one rotten apple can mess up the whole batch? Yeah. Better watch it. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor, but Jesus, aware of this, replied, Why criticize this woman for doing such a thing to me? You always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. She has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deeds will be remembered and discussed. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, 
went to the leading priests and asked, how much will you pay me to, to betray Jesus to you? This is disgusting. And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. From that time on, Jesus, Jesus, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Old Testament, you could buy a slave in Israel for 30 pieces of silver. And I want you to look three things here. Here are three different people, three different valuations of Jesus' worth. Think about it. Here's Mary. She gave her burial, her burial perfume. Broke the jar. It was in an alabaster jar. That in itself was crazy expensive. Broke the thing. Poured it all over him. A year's worth of salary. That's what she thought. She thought Jesus was amazing. Huh? She valued him. Then the disciples, obviously, um, Judas had been talking to him. Man, he's, we shouldn't have been wasting that. Man, that's a big, fat waste. Poured it on him. Are you kidding me? And often people will come in off the street, you know, and when a guest comes into your home in the Middle East in the first century, it's a kind thing to anoint them with olive oil because you're smelly or even put some perfume on. They're, you're smelly. You've been out in the, in the uh, arid desert region there, and so you come in. So, you know, anointing with oil is just an act of kindness, right? So... My goodness. So, but the disciples said, man, what a waste. Well, that was their evaluation. Jesus is just like any other person. Don't be wasting that much money on a, another person. And then you have the valuation of Judas. Jesus is no better than a slave. Well, you know, one thing he did get right, though. Jesus became a slave for you and me. He allowed himself to be the, man, the beast of burden for our sin. He allowed himself to carry what only he could carry to absolve the sins of mankind. Him who knew no sin, he was made to be our sin. Yeah, Jesus became a slave, yeah. So you know what? Maybe Judas did get it more right than you realize. But that was his valuation of Jesus. So, you know, ask yourself, how do I value Jesus? Is he just another man? Is a life that doesn't matter? A lot of people think about somebody in, as a slave. You know, that's just a devalued person. You know, a lot of people in America, you know, you say you love Jesus. The only way you show you love Jesus is by living for him and changing your life according to his values. If my life never changes, I really don't value him. If I receive him, a lot of people today say, hey, I can receive Jesus like, like when I went to... You know, when I go to India, you know, people want to receive Jesus. And, and I've told you this, I went, into a, I went into a Hindu temple and here's all the, they got 300 million gods. This one probably had two dozen gods, statues all the way around the perimeter of the opulent, gaudy, expensive building. And I was in my sock feet while rats ran around. And I looked at all, and, but, and they, had, they had Jesus up with their other gods. And I looked at the guy and said, well, 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 there's something wrong with this picture. Is this Jesus the Christ on a white horse? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, he said. This is Jesus on a white horse. I said, well, he's up here with the rest of the Hindu God. Oh, yes, we're recognizing Jesus. They just didn't believe he was the Christ, the anointed one, the Son of God. A lot of people do that. They receive Jesus and just put it on the, him on the shelf with the rest of their gods. Huh? I could go into a lot of detail there. You fill in all the blanks. People in our culture have lots of gods. But when Jesus is Lord, he changes how you live your life. You give up your drink. You give up your habits. You give up your illicit sex. You give up your porn. You give up your stuff. And you say, Jesus, come and cleanse me. I don't want to ever be what I was again. It's not that you never sin or never make a mistake, but your heart is, God, I'm not that anymore. I'm yours. How many hear me? Now, Judas, Judas had the wrong idea. How many think uh, this lady Mary had the right idea? Yeah. So then Matthew 26, 17, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal? 
uh, for you. As you go into the city, he told them, you will see a certain man. Tell him, the teacher says, my time is coming. I will eat a Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus told them, prepared the Passover meal. Um, when it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve. Uh, while they're eating, he said, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. So I've tried to play this thing out in my mind. So here's 12 guys, and Jesus is the 13th guy. And they're all, you know, they're, they're laying down on the floor with, uh, propped up on an elbow so they can eat with one hand. And they're just kind of laying around like that because they, they ate in a, a kind of semi-reclined position. And they were really close to each other, so they're, you know, they're just talking and you know, talking about this and that and, you know, carrying on individual conversations and, you know, some of them probably chatting with Jesus and, and then, you know, here comes the bread, here comes the, here comes the grape juice and, and, um, and Jesus just kind of, kind of, you know, gets kind of quiet. He said, guys, I got, I got something to say. I said, what is it, Jesus? They've been around him for three years. They've been around each other for over three years. They know each other well. They've bedded down together. They've, had to, they've eaten together. They've done things together. They've traveled together. They've gone through some tough places together. They've had a lot of experiences. So when you, when you get close to somebody, you, there's banter, right? It's just casual conversation. That's the way it was. And I can just kind of see Jesus getting really quiet, looking down. This, the finally, one by one, they look at him. He said, I, um, I got something to tell you. What? One of you. been with me three years one of you is going to betray me can you imagine being one of the 12 it grabs a wall wait a minute is it i it be this one. and that's why they said lord is, is it me yes. greatly distressed each one of them asked in turn am i the one lord it tears god jesus is it me what did you say me? If it's not me, one of my brothers I've been talking to all this time? Wow. Hmm. He replied, one of you who has just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me. Now, you know, they would take bread, dip it in. Y'all like, uh, y'all like dipping sauce? Olive oil with spices in it. So you stick the bread in there and a sign of great friendship you stick that, aren't you hungry yet? You dip it in there and you give it to a close friend. Jesus had dipped it and he looked around and everybody's looking and he gives it to Judas. Hmm. Greatly distressed, am I the one? He replied, one of you who has just eaten from the bowl with me will betray me for the son of man must die as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays me. It would be far better for me, for that man, if he had never been born. Jesus, Judas, the one who betrayed him, asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus said, you said it. You know, you can read a lot into that. This is not my sermon today. Here's a guy that walked with Jesus over three years. Y'all, he is not in heaven today. He's in hell. Jesus said it would be better for that man. Read what he was saying. It'd be better to never be born than to spend eternity in the flames of hell. We live in a day today, except Jesus, you can, you can be a fornicator. You can have sex with anybody that walks. And if you love Jesus, he forgives and cleanses your life. Oh, you can love Jesus and be a homosexual or a lesbian. You can be Jesus. You can love Jesus and be a thief and steal people's money. Extortion. Practice extortion. You can be, you love Jesus and lie. You can love Jesus and Shoot your veins full of stuff. Love Jesus and be a drunkard. <sighs> See, Judas thought, well, I can love Jesus. I love money too. 
it costs him. So could it be that perhaps we're wrong in thinking that once you're saved, you're always saved? Here's what I say. You're saved as long as you want to be. That's not popular. I was raised in a church that said once you name the name Jesus, you can never be unnamed by him. Judas was. You need to think. I hope I'm wrong. But if I'm not wrong, we need to straighten up. Now, let me, let me put the, turn over the other side of the coin here. If you're struggling with yourself, listen to me. You're struggling with alcohol. You're a guy here or a lady. You're struggling with porn. Are you struggling with over-the-counter medication or prescription drugs? Are you struggling and maybe you go do some crack every now and then? Or you smoke pot? You go find somebody selling weed and get you some. Or maybe you've had a lifestyle of being loose sexually and you fall. Here's the key. Here's the caveat right here, right here. When you sin, is there deep-seated regret and remorse in your life. My God, I have I've denied my Savior and put my flesh before Him. And are you personally, inwardly grieved? See the difference? So as a believer, it's not that you don't sin. Because all of us are at varying levels of growth in God. And we're at varying levels of being set apart to Jesus and coming away from all the habits of the flesh. Yes or no? And where you're a young believer, you struggle with your flesh. As an older believer, you'll struggle with internal things that you've had all of your life. How many hear what I'm saying? So if you're struggling, don't go away from here saying, that pastor said I might not be saved. No, I didn't say that. But here's the deal. If you want to do what you're doing and there's no repentance in your life. See, that was, uh, see, that was Judas. He had no repentance. He was greedy. He was a thief. He loved money. He didn't like to give a dime away unless he had to. Well, I got to buy him some lunch. Well, I got to buy him some stuff. Well, I got to buy, find a place to stay. Find the cheapest one in town, mate. He was greedy and he liked it. He liked it so much he liked those little silver coins he was going to get from the high priests. See what I'm saying? So what about me and what about you? Judas is in hell today. I wonder how many people today say they love Jesus. The lifestyle has never changed. Don't forget Matthew 7 said, Narrow is the way. Confined is the way that leads to life. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Years ago, Susan and I had a picture somebody gave us in our living room. And it was a picture back probably from the 1700s. And here's a path, and, and it's one path, and then, then one path goes, and it's a broad path, and then, and then here's another path, and it's narrow, and you got a bunch of people walking down the broad path, and you got one walking down the narrow. It's Matthew 7. So, you know, which one are you on? Which one am I on? Big question. Here's another angle on Jesus. Y'all okay? Here's John's angle on Jesus' betrayal. John 12. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus. Gives a little more information. The man he had raised from the dead. Now, that's an exciting thing. Here's the guy that's dead, and he's in his house. Wow. It's like, wow. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha, that's the woman, Martha. And Lazarus were among those who ate with him. Then Mary, Mary's, Mary Magdalene, she was demon-possessed prostitute. Took a tw and Jesus set her free. A 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard. And she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with a fragrance. Y'all, any time you worship Jesus, it fills the place you are with him. Do you hear me? You can fill your car with that presence. You can be at your cubby working in your job. And I know you can't sing out loud, but you're praising God inside. You're feeling that place with the presence. You can fill your house with the presence. How many hear me? You're taking a walk. You're filling your neighborhood with that presence because you're worshiping. 
He, they broke, he, she broke that thing open, man. It filled the house with that smell. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, that perfume was worth a year's wage. It should have been sold in money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Aha! Aha! Now, Jesus knew he was stealing and still let him do it. I have a fault. I have a pastor's heart. I will let people be volunteers, and I know some stuff in their life ain't right yet. You shouldn't be doing it. Jesus did. Because he loved people. And he believed that God could change people. Could it be that you're in the family of God, your imperfect self? Say what? And even God uses you to minister to people sometimes. But you got this one area, this Achilles heel. It's like, ah, it grabs me. But God still uses you. Why? Could it be? that Jesus believes the best of every person and gives every single person an opportunity to make it right? Could it be he knew what was in Judas, that he knew he was a thief, knew he was stealing from him, and let him steal? Because he wanted to see if Judas would finally turn and repent. Isn't that something? You know what that shows me? The grace and mercy of God. God will follow you all the days of your life. And he'll cry out to you in your heart. The Holy Spirit will say, change, change. Ask me, seek me. Let me help you. Cry out. See, the issue is not that you have problems. The issue is God wants your heart. How many hear me? Jesus replied, not that he cared for the poor. Let's go back to verse 6. He was a thief since he was in charge of the disciples' money. He often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. John 13, here we are again. They're at the Last Supper. I'm not saying these things to all of you. He had just washed their feet. I know the ones I have chosen, but this fulfills the Scripture that says the one who eats my food has turned against me. I tell you this beforehand, so that when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. I tell you the truth. Anyone who welcomes my messengers welcoming me, anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. Now Jesus was deeply troubled, and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other, wondering whom he could mean. The disciple Jesus loved, John. Now, now John had a little bit of pride problem, would you say? The disciple whom Jesus loved. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting next to the table at Jesus, Simon Peter motioned to him, Who's he talking about? So that disciple leaned over to Jesus and asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus responded, It's the one whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. And when he dipped it, he gave it to Judas, Simon, uh, son of Simon Iscariot. And when Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. He entered into league with the thoughts that kept coming and agreed with them and acted on them. Then Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. Since Judas was the treasurer, some thought Jesus was telling him to go and pay for the food or to give some money to the poor. So Jesus, Judas left at once going out into the night. So... So, so here's, here's Judas. Now, Jesus left him on his team. But here's the deal. This, just think about the 12 disciples. Matthew was a tax collector, y'all. It's also named Levi. Tax collectors were thieves, too. They charged more taxes than were due. And they lived in big houses and drove big cars for their, so to speak, for their day. You know, a big donkey, maybe, I don't know. Big cart. You get it. But, you know, the idea is they're living off the people. Everybody knows they're a thief. And nobody likes them. And Jesus calls them a tax collector. Here, James and John, sons of thunder. 
Jesus was being criticized by the religious people. And they said, you want us to call fire down from heaven like Elijah did? And Jesus said, you don't even know what spirit you're from. And then here's Peter in the same crowd. Peter was a fisherman. Fishermen stink. They smell like fish. And then G- Peter denied Jesus, not once, not twice, thrice. Wow. But here's Judas. What am I saying? All of them had problems. So think it, think it out. It's not that you don't have issues. It is but that the issues don't have you. Right? So there's Judas. Jesus let him stay for three and a half years. In his, in his ministry on Taraj. God allows imperfect people in his family. Aren't you glad he allows me and you? See, the issue is we have to work out our own salvation with fear and with trembling. So here's a question. All of them had seeds of wrong in their life. Obviously, they were allowing God to deal with them. Except Judas. Except Judas. So here's a question. What seeds in you could germinate like leaven and spoil your life in God? It's a good question, huh? Yeah. What's inside? Paul said this, 1 Timothy 5, 24. Remember, the sins of some people are obvious, leading them to certain judgment. But there are others whose sins will not be revealed until later. That's Judas. So what's working in you? That's the reason all of us, honestly, you know, I pray and seek God and pray for others, but I also have a time of self-introspection. Even the philosophers 2,500 years ago said the unexamined life is not worth living. Examine yourself. See if you're in the faith. Song of Solomon 2.15, catch the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. Our vines have tender grapes, so they have vin- grape vineyards, and that we had grapes, and my, my dad had all kinds of fruit trees. We had grapes. We had conquered grapes. Everybody, anybody ever heard of scuppernons? They're, they're wonderful, wonderful. We had them way up off the ground, and they had big gnarly looking, you know, vines, and they grow real big and expansive. The conquered grapes were beautiful and blue, just wonderful to eat. And there, you know, go at nighttime, the, the big animals, they can't reach the grapes on top if they've got them up on sticks and such, on poles, because they're way up off the ground. But it's the little tiny foxes. They'd run up the vine and steal all the grapes. The farmer wakes up in the morning, they're gone. The little fox got them. So it's the little things in life that grab us and hinder us. See, this thing in Judas, this greed thing, it could have started small. Maybe he got it from his daddy. Maybe his family was just real thrifty and always looking to, you know, get a dime, so to speak, in some way. And maybe it was not all above board. So it wasn't all bad, perhaps, when it started out. But see, because he didn't judge himself, that thing judged him. So what about me and you? You have to ask yourself, what in me does God need to deal with? Remember this often quoted Sin will take you farther than you want to go, make you stay longer than you plan to stay, and make you pay more than you plan to pay. I'm sure Judas, I'm sure Judas, when he betrayed Jesus and had that silver in his hand and then threw it down in the street, <sighs> God, what have I done? What have I? He couldn't believe himself. What I allowed myself to? See, he allowed that one little seed to grow. He never... He never self-judged, obviously. Or God would have helped. Jesus would have helped him. How many hear me? It's interesting, right? Sin left unopposed in my life will leave a crack in the door and Satan can come in. It's what we need to be careful with. So what leaven is in you that Jesus wants to put his finger on and deliver you from? So I've got a list here. I just wrote a few things down. It may be pride. I think every human has to deal with pride. I've dealt with pride all of my life. I mean, uh, I had false pride. God would use me and somebody say thank you. And I say, it's just the Lord. Oh, come on, you proud thing. 
Just say thank you and then go to God and say thank you. i never forget a prophet, Dick Mills, years ago in her 90s, came to a church I was pastoring in South Carolina, and this man was well-known. Uh, in fact, he wrote the notes in the New, uh, New, Spirit, New Life Spirit-filled Bible. And just a wonderful man of God, a very educated, scholarly man, and he uh, was used as a prophet after the service. I, never, I couldn't find him. We had people all over us, where's Dick? Where's Dick Mills? I couldn't find him. Uh, the, 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 the pastoral office door was ajar, just open just a little bit. And the light was on, the little lamp. It was kind of dark in the room. I said, wait, wait. I opened that door. And this man was in a corner in a chair. And he had his hands raised up and his eyes shut. I said, Dick, you okay? I said, what are you doing in the corner? And he said, every time God uses me, I get away with him. And I give him the thanks. And I give him the credit. And I give him the praise. Y'all, what was that? I was 30, I was 30, um, 34 years old when I saw that. You realize the impression that left on me? So you know what? Anytime you say, Pastor, great message, I get off. Thank you. All of us have to deal with pride. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's okay to be accomplished. It's okay to be skilled. It's okay to be good at what you're doing. Just don't take the credit yourself. Say thank you to the person, but make sure you go in the end and say thank you to Jesus. Jealousy. Jealousy has been the ruin of many a person. Huh? Let's talk about some things we all needed. Greed. That was Judas' thing. Stinginess. I know people. Man, it almost hurts to put $5 in the offering. That five dollars became it weighed a ton. Oh! Yeah, stingy, anger. Now I've had to deal with anger in my life. I can be of my personality type can get angry pretty quick. Just ask me. Just come and say something stupid to me after service. That's it. I'm kidding. I've had to lay my anger at the altar. Huh? I'm a wordsmith. I mean, I can. I can. I can work you down with words pretty quickly. I can whittle away at you. I sin, y'all. God's had to deal with me about ain't lust. A lot of people have lust. Men, men particularly, their sex drive is related to their eyeballs. That's why men, women, watch how you dress. You're asking your brother to have trouble. How many hear me? And men, you, need to, you don't need to be looking like a peacock yourself. You need to straighten up. Because lust is a problem with men and women. How many hear me? Stubbornness. Oh, I'm about done, y'all, really. Stubbornness is a huge problem. I'm going to do it while my way. I don't care. I don't care what you think. I don't care what it does to the family. I don't care if nobody ever talked. I'm going to do it this. I'm going to do it now. I'm going to do it next time. Stubborn rascal. Stubbornness reminds me of the goats in Ethiopia when I go. I've never seen a more stubborn animal in my life. They will butt, they'll look at you, you think they're smiling, they'll butt you. They'll hit you, they'll hit you right on your thigh, right on your butt. I mean, they'll knock you down. They're stubborn. Then you try to get them to go one way, they say, I ain't going that way, I'm going this way. I plan to go, I'm going this way. There's a lot of people are that way. Stubborn gossip. Gossip's a real problem in America today. Gossip is called Facebook, Snapchat, whatever. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. Selfishness. I like to please me. I like to be satisfied. You don't make me happy. Well, get over that stuff. And then obviously all kinds of addictions. Some people have food addictions. Some people have sex addictions. Some people have tobacco addictions. Other people have alcohol addictions, physical, fleshly addictions. So what is the thing in you? I think everybody's got something. And if you don't, will you please come and talk to me because I want to find out if you're real flesh and blood or maybe you're a person from another planet because humans have problems, right? Huh? A lot of religious people come in, they, they dress to the nines. They act like everything's perfect. If you got to dress all up, you're probably hiding something. That's really rough and I'm sorry, y'all. I apologize ahead of time. People hide behind things today like I've never seen. 
Stand up on your feet. I'm meddling too much. I'm done. Did you get something out of that?